everyone. It's Annie from Polar Explorers, and I'm so excited that you're joining for this online version of our South Georgia Island and Shackleton Endurance Expedition presentation. This has to be one of the most exciting expeditions in all of polar history, maybe even all of history. And, um, and I'm thrilled to be sharing these awesome photos with you and stories from this expedition. So without any further delay, let's go right ahead and jump into the expedition. I'll share my screen and we will get started. Alrighty, so South Georgia Island and the Endurance Expedition. This expedition uh, took place in 1914 is when it kicked off. So let's just set the scene about what was going on in polar history in, and in the world in 1914. It was the height of the heroic age. Um, people everywhere were fascinated by uh, polar expedition and polar exploration. And after a century of exploring the Arctic and Antarctic, the British felt that it was a matter of national pride to lay claim to the poles. However, in April of 1909, Americans Robert Peary and Matthew Henson, along with several Inuit, reached the North Pole. It also happens that in 1909, Shackleton established a new farthest south. Um, and then in 1911, um, Norway's Roald Amundsen and his team reached the South Pole, only to be followed a month later by Britain's Robert Falcon Scott and his team, uh, who of course only uh, perish on their return trip to the base camp. Now Shackleton was surprised and saddened by the loss of Scott, but he felt strongly that there was still more to be done in Antarctica and that an English team should be the ones to do it. The reality was that Shackleton was not at peace at home. He was a public hero and he wanted to be a businessman, but he wasn't very good at it. So he relied on giving lectures for his income. Then he decided to embark on the one great main object of Antarctic journeying that remains, and that would be crossing the polar continent from sea to sea. And this was an expedition that had originally been conceived of by a Scottish explorer named William Bruce, but he couldn't secure the funding for it. In this endeavor, Shackleton had a little competition. There was a German expedition led by Wilhelm Filchner that departed South Georgia Island for the Weddell Sea in December of 1911. Their plan was to set up a base at Vashel Bay right here and uh, then traverse Antarctica, much like Shackleton wanted to do. Um, but the expedition wasn't successful in building their base camp at Vashel Bay. The ship, the Deutschland, entered up stuck in the sea ice, much like the endurance would become. But fortunately, it drifted far enough north that the sea ice uh, let the ship go and the entire crew was able to return to South Georgia. However, by that time, the expedition was in complete disarray, which is it's a story for another time. Um, this is Shackleton's planned route. You can see he was going to come in from South America. He was going to go to restock at South Georgia, go into the Weddell Sea, uh, where he would access the Antarctic continent. He would cross Antarctica here, utilizing some caches that were being laid by his Ross Sea Party, an entirely different group of people who, uh, who came in a different ship just to lay those depots. And then he would leave via New Zealand. Now, this expedition cost 50,000 British pounds to pull off, which he solicited from the government and private donors. And three of the late donors that allowed the expedition to proceed were Dudley Docker, Janet San Stancombe Wills and Sir James Caird. Remember those names because if you don't know already, they become very important in this story. Um, this map, by the way, was published in 1916 uh, after um, Shackleton had not been heard of uh, since the end of 1914, so a couple of years into his expedition. Now, you may have seen this famous ad that Shackleton supposedly wrote looking for his crew, but the reality is that this ad never likely existed. It's never been found, and Shackleton didn't need an ad. Just with the announcement of his expedition, he had over 5,000 applications from people wanting to join the crew. Most positions had many applicants, and for some positions, there were very few applicants. For the position of second doctor, there was only one applicant, Dr. James McElroy, who had malaria during his interview and was so physically sick that he was shaking from the illness, but Shackleton took him on. So from the 5,000 applicants, Shackleton narrowed it down to 27 men. There was a stowaway who joined the expedition in Buenos Aires, 
So ultimately, Shackleton ended up with a crew of 28 men. Shackleton purchased a ship called the Polaris for 11,600 pounds. She was renamed uh, Endurance after Shackleton's family motto, which is, by Endurance we conquer. And this rare lantern slide shows the Endurance in August of 1914. At this point, she still had a white hull. The photo was likely taken when the Endurance set sail from Plymouth for South America. And you may recall that the UK entered World War I on August 3rd of 1914. Shackleton, when he heard this, immediately offered up the boat, the crew, and all the supplies to the King's service. But within an hour of sending his telegram, a response came from Winston Churchill, who was then the Lord, First Lord of the Admiralty. <clears throat> and it said only one word, and that word was proceed. So the Endurance left British waters on August 8th. By October, the Endurance had reached Buenos Aires and spent some time restocking her provisions and getting a fresh coat of paint. And here she is off the coast of South America in the, uh, in the brown color, which is what we're normally uh, used to seeing. On October 26th, the Endurance set sail for the remote whaling outpost of South Georgia Island in the middle of the Southern Atlantic Ocean. South Georgia was a common last point for, uh, last port for ships headed to Antarctica. It's remote and it's inhospitable, but it is very beautiful and rich in biodiversity. And then a month later on November 5th, she arrived at South Georgia Island and spent one month at the Gritvik and Whaling Station restocking and also picking the brains of the whalers who were familiar with the Weddell Sea. And what the whalers told Shackleton was that the sea ice that year was very heavy and that uh, he should reconsider and if possible delay but he, uh, he didn't take their advice. So they set sail from South Georgia on the Endurance from uh, on December 5th, bound for Vashel Bay, Antarctica, down here. And um, on December 7th, only two days after leaving South Georgia, uh, the Endurance entered the pack ice. And this was surely exciting news uh, for some of the crew who had not seen pack ice before, but it would have been disconcerting for Shackleton who did not expect the ice to be so far to the north and certainly not as dense as it was. Um, despite some zigzagging, they made good progress to the south. And uh, notice the vantage point of those two top photographs. They're taken from high in the rigging. And that's because Frank Hurley, this guy here, uh, was the expedition photographer and he was known to climb the rigging to get the best photos of the ship. On January 19th, when they were only one day sail from the coast of Antarctica, the Endurance became trapped. And then by February 22nd, the pack ice had carried the Endurance to 77 degrees south, which would be the furthest south that the Endurance would travel. After 10 days with little movement, a lead opened up nearby and Shackleton, who was excited by the opportunity for escape, ordered all of the men into the, onto the ice with pickaxes and saws and ice chisels, shovels, anything they could get in the hopes of carving out a channel to access the lead. He also had all the sails raised to harness the wind, but to no avail. So with the ship stuck, Shackleton abandoned the plan to overwinter at Vashel Bay, and instead he got comfortable on the Endurance for the Austral autumn and winter. They actually ended up living on board the Endurance from January through October. But life on board the ship was good. The carpenter brought aboard a cat that they named Mr. Chippy, as in Chips of Wood, and they also had the companionship of 69 dogs. But unfortunately, a case of worms, combined with the oversight of leaving behind the worm medicine, resulted in several of the dogs dying. There were hikes on the pack ice and games of football, and those of you who have spent some time on the pack ice might recognize the ice flowers in the bottom right-hand picture um, that are formed as saltwater freezes. And here's a, a shot of dog teams getting ready for some exercise on the sea ice. I love that picture. Inside the Endurance, there was much to do. Scientific observations were taken and recorded. The ship was cleaned and there was time for some rest and relaxation. So here you can see a game of chess being played by Hurley and Hussey and some scientific experiments being conducted in the lab. And there on the bottom uh, is the Ritz which is the name they gave to their living quarters. And it's being cleaned and it got a thorough cleaning every two weeks. The crew was remarkably adaptive, adaptable. 
and quick to identify a chance to turn any ordinary activity like getting a haircut into a shipwide celebration. I think that all of us who are expedition people like to think of ourselves as adaptable and um, and good at making a party out of uh, out of small events. Midwinter, which is always a cause for celebration in Antarctica, was also made into a big occasion on, on the endurance. And here is the midwinter dinner, which was celebrated on June 22nd of 1915. And they're having pork, stewed apples, and peas. And it was followed by a midwinter variety show, emceed by none other than Shackleton himself. The characters included a minister named Reverend Bubbling Love, a German professor, a wicked looking Spanish girl with a very low evening dress, a drunk and a London streetwalker. Football was a popular pastime, as were other sporting events, such as the first ever Antarctic Derby, which had five competing dog teams. Frank Wilde's team, which pulled a total of 910 pounds over the 700 yard race course, won in two minutes and 16 seconds. All 28 men had bet on the race and the winners were paid in chocolate and cigarettes. And at night, it was common for the person who had the night watch duties to wake his friends so that they could sit around the fire and talk. This famous photograph is called The Night Watchman Spins a Yard. A yarn, sorry. The Night Watchman Spins a Yarn. And um, it's one of my favorites too. Overall, life was really good uh, on the frozen endurance. Pretty good, I guess I should say. But uh, from April through October, the ship held fast and frequently compressing ice caused it to shift and to roll, which would have been quite disconcerting. And then on October 24th, the pressure of the ice twisted the ship's stern post, causing serious damage and leaks. And then on October 27th, Shackle Shackleton ordered the crew to abandon ship. They dumped all of the supplies onto a flow at a site that they called Dump Camp. And then they made a more permanent camp three miles away on a flow that they called Ocean Camp. The crew of the Endurance lived at Ocean Camp from November 1st to late December. They had a lookout built for hunting purposes, as well as to check the ice for cracks and also to take navigational sightings. Um, but this also gave them a decent view of the Endurance, which was slowly being consumed by the frozen ocean. In early November, Hurley, the expedition photographer, returned to his ship to retrieve many of his precious negatives. He had to make his way through four feet of slushy, icy water while the ship creaked and groaned all around, around him. But Shackleton, who was very aware of the importance of monetizing his story after the expedition, knew how critical it was to save some of these slides. On November 21st, Shackleton roused the crew from their tents. He called out, she's going boys and everyone came to watch the final moments of the endurance. Then shortly later in a quieter voice, he said, she's gone. And it's hard for me to imagine what it must have felt like to see your home and the last permanent tie to civilization go down beneath the ice. Shackleton ordered extra rations to help keep the crew's spirits up. So here's a map showing the route so far. You can see an overall clockwise, um, clockwise drift in the ice. At times they were drifting up to seven miles a day. They were hoping to drift close enough to land over here that they could uh, make a short crossing over the ice by ski. Life at Ocean Camp was uncomfortable, but pretty pleasant. They came to dread warm weather uh, because it made everything soaking wet. Drying lines were common, but clothing and sleeping bags were seldom dry. In late December, Shackleton decided to make a move towards land, hopefully Paulette Island, which was about 250 miles away, where he knew there was a stash of food from a previous expedition. He gave everyone a personal weight limit of two pounds. Most people had to bury the bulk of their personal items in the snow. So the crew abandoned Ocean Camp, but over the course of two days, they were only able to make seven miles across the treacherous ice that was broken in some places and compressed with difficult ridges in other places. Shackleton determined that at that rate, it would take them over 300 days 
of really backbreaking work to reach land. And here they are pulling the James Caird across the ice. Instead, they created a new camp and they named it Patience Camp, which became their home for more than three months. And what I love about this picture is that with some of the other pictures um, of them in their camps, <clears throat> you see things in the background, you know, it looks sort of like a busy place because it's a close up picture and you see people walking in the background or other tents or various things. But this picture just shows how small that camp was and how vast the ocean is around it. And it just, it, it really puts things into perspective for me. <clears throat> Life at Patience Camp was pleasant, but fairly difficult. Food was running short by then and they had eaten through their rations of what we might call regular food. And eventually they survived on seal meat alone with one cup of warm milk per day. They relied heavily on routines, including a specific routine for eating meals. And here's how it went. In each tent, one person was designated as the cook, in parentheses, or sorry, in quotation marks, the cook. That person actually didn't do any cooking. The expedition cook did the cooking, but rather it was this person's job <clears throat> to go get the hoosh from the makeshift galley seen above there, divvy it up into the individual tent bowls for your tent mates, and at the end of the meal, wash all the bowls. So each person held on to his own individual spoon. This duty was rotated on an alphabetical basis by the people in the tent, and the food was divided very carefully to avoid any notion of unfairness. After rationing out the hoosh into, into individual bowls, <clears throat> The tent cook would point to a bowl while another tent mate who was blindfolded would say a person's name. And thus each bowl of food was handed out. The food and the supplies as well as the lifeboats were kept on sledges in case they needed to make a quick escape in the event of breaking ice. <clears throat> while at patient's camp, they drifted north of the Antarctic Circle. On March 17th, they reached the same latitude as Paul at Island right there but they were 60 miles to the east. There was no chance of reaching it over the ice due to prevailing currents. They had to change their plans. Shackleton knew a few things about this area from a previous expedition, not his own expedition, but from expeditions that he had read about <clears throat> and knew about. There was a modest wooden church and a cache of food on Deception Island over here from a previous Swedish Antarctic expedition. <coughs> this was their first choice, but again, it was against the current and prevailing winds. Clarence Island was visible to them up here, as was Elephant Island. And the latter one, Elephant Island, suggesting by name only that it might be home to an elephant seal population. So that was appealing. They had also heard that there was a cave on Prince George Island right here. But they didn't know any specific details about the size or location of the cave. In the end, weather, ocean conditions, and ice conditions ultimately would determine their destination. On April 8th, the flow at Patience Camp suddenly began to break up, and they found themselves on a small triangular piece of ice amid the floating pack. Shackleton readied the camp to be abandoned, and then on April 9th, they, la they launched their three lifeboats and began their escape, ultimately to Elephant Island. The boat journey to Elephant Island took six days. The first two nights, they were able to get some rest on the ice flows, but on the second night, the ice suddenly cracked open beneath one of the tents and a person fell into the ocean while he was sleeping in his sleeping bag. Shackleton happened to be awake pacing, which is something that he did quite a bit of, and heard this happen and pulled the man out of the water. The men in general feared for their lives, not only from cracking ice, but also from ice flows crushing them, from large waves capsizing them in the lifeboats, and from whales, whom they called killers, attacking them. And they could hear the whales blowing all around them, and they just felt like sitting ducks. After the second night of five nights, they did not get out of the boats. Soon they had left the ice, flown be ice flows behind, and they'd entered the open ocean but they forgot to bring with them chunks of ice to quench their thirst. So for three days, they did not drink and their thirst was unbearable. They had food, but their mouths were so swollen, it was difficult to eat. Worsley, the navigator, Shackleton and Frank Wilde, who was Shackleton's second in command, went 100 hours without rest. One person uh, sustained bad frostbite on his foot, 
which eventually led to amputation. And all others were, everyone was wearing clothing that was frozen solid and they could only huddle together for warmth. And this picture was painted by George Marston, the expedition artist, and I love this photo of him. Um, it's kind of fun to see what he looked like. There were numerous moments when it all could have gone completely wrong. But finally on the sixth day, which was April 15th, all 28 men arrived at Elephant Island. And this is the first land that they had touched in 16 months. The cook quickly set, was sent ashore and he prepared the first drink and hot food in three and a half days. And everyone ate to their heart's content because there were several seals on the beach who were quickly killed and butchered. But the site wasn't good for the long haul. You can see that there's mountains right there and the high tide mark went right up to the cliff walls behind the beach. Rockfall threatened everyone. And after two nights, they had to move seven miles down the coast to a spot where there was a long spit of land where they can make a better camp. And what you don't read too much about was that um, several, of the, uh, several of the crew were really terrified to get back in the boats. They really felt like they had dodged a bullet even getting to Elephant Island. And they, they, they felt deep down inside that if they got back into the lifeboats, they weren't going to be so lucky to touch shore again. At this new site, they set about establishing a more permanent camp. They attempted to dig out a snow cave from a snowfield for their um, for their accommodations, but it was determined to be too wet and too much spin drift. Um, so at first they stayed in their batter tents and then they eventually moved under overturned lifeboats. So Elephant Island had never before been visited by whalers. It had been seen, but never visited. And Shackleton knew that their only chance at rescue lay in summoning help themselves. The nearest port was the nearest port was um, was Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands. Here we go up there. But to get there, they would be going against the prevailing winds. Thus, Shackleton chose to head to South Georgia Island over here, which was 800 miles away. For eight days, the men prepared the James Caird, which was the largest of their three lifeboats at 22 feet for the voyage to South Georgia Island. They used bits of fabric and some of Marston's remaining paint to caulk the cracks in the boat. And here's a look inside the James Caird and how it was packed. That's ballast on the bottom and in the bow, a small area for laying flat while not on deck. Um, not such good rest. Five men were selected to go with Shackleton. And finally, the day came to, to depart. It was April 24th, 1916. And here is the Stancombe Wills as she um, prepares to supply the 22 foot James Caird with ballast and food. So that's the, this one is the, um, the Stancombe Wills. And here's the James Caird down below. And what I love about this picture is how narrow you realize the lifeboat is. Like you think of them and you always hear about an open, open boat journey. And, and at least in my mind, the boat's a little bit bigger than that. That looks so narrow. Even here, it looks wider, but this picture here really gives you some perspective on how small that boat was. Here's a famous um, image of Shackleton and the crew of the James Caird leaving Elephant Island. And if this picture says one thing to me, it's hope. Like the amount of hope that was on the shoulders of every single person in the James Caird was tremendous. I love that they took on that challenge. Sea conditions were pretty rough, and shortly after departing, everything was soaked. Ice then coated the outside of the James Caird, and she became sluggish and top-heavy. And under the deck, everything was wet, and rest was extremely hard to come by. It took three people to sail the James Caird, one person at the tiller, one person bailing, and one person managing the buildup of ice on the deck and the sails. And then down below, sleep was barely possible. They constantly needed to shift the sharp and pokey ballast rocks under their waterlogged reindeer sleeping bags. It took three people to manage the cooker and pot. Reindeer hares got into all of their food and water. And at one point they had to, they were getting so low in the water um, that they had to jettison stuff. And they judged that one of their reindeer sleeping bags weighed about 40 pounds. To make matters worse, they lost their sea anchor in a storm as well as an important rope that had helped them manage their sails. And then on May 5th, they encountered a massive gale. Shackleton, during the storm, saw a clearing in the sky and roused the others to celebrate. 
only to realize that it wasn't a clear sky. It was a massive white cap off of an e even larger massive wave. He shouted, for God's sake, hold on, it's got us. The rough seas almost capsized them on several occasions during the 16 day voyage. Amazingly though, and no doubt because of Worsley's outstanding skill with navigation, they spotted South Georgia Island, but it was only with incredible ingenuity and a whole lot of luck that they were able to survive the hurricane strength winds that were pushing them toward the rocky shoreline where of course they would have been smashed to bits. A handful of years ago, this open boat journey of the James Caird was recreated in period clothing and an exact replica of the James Caird on an expedition called um, Shackleton Epic. And some of you may have seen the three-part documentary about this expedition. In the US, it played on PBS and I'm, I'm sure that it can still be found somewhere. On May 10th, they landed the James Caird on the south side of South Georgia Island. The crew of six were completely malnourished. They were dehydrated and in need of serious rest and recuperation. They took five days uh, before they repositioned the James Caird at the head of a nearby bay, um, now called King Hokan Bay. And here's where they landed on South Georgia Island. You can see this is the long bay where they repositioned to down at the head of King Hokan Bay. Um, but they needed to get, and here's where, here's where the, the uh, whaling station that they were trying to get to, that's where that is. So they needed to get to the north side of the island where the stations were. Um, and this meant that they needed to cross the interior of the mountains, all this, um, which were glacier ridden and, uh, and, and unmapped. And so they had no map and no supplies. There are no pictures and really very few artist, re artist renditions of their crossing. They took screws from the James Caird. They took the carpenter's ads. Uh, they had some rope and a few rations. They dared not sleep because they feared that they would freeze to death. Instead, they marched for 36 hours straight. And here's Shackleton's rough memory map of their crossing. They made a couple of wrong turns, which is easy to do with no map and, and little energy. Um, and you'll see how surprisingly accurate that is in just a few more slides. There were many moments that could have ended in disaster on Shackleton's Crossing. They had one blind descent off a very steep mountain on their bums to escape overnighting at altitude where they were sure that they would perish. Another time when sleep nearly lulled them into a deathly grip, Shackleton allowed Creasy and, Creasy and Worsley to take a quick nap. And after five minutes, of sleeping, Shackleton woke them up and told them that they had been asleep for half an hour. The need to keep moving was literally a matter of life and death. Now that picture, of course, is not from Shackleton's expedition. That's from one of ours. And those are a few of our, our teammates, including Rick here, um, recreating that scene. On the morning of May 29th, they heard the steam bell from the Stromness whaling station. It was morning and the bell uh, that went off was the one that called the workers to breakfast. After 33 hours on the go, they had finally had Stromness in their sights. One of our guides, Dirk Jensen, illustrated this moment over here, uh, this moment in their crossing when they first saw the buildings of Stromness whaling station. When Shackleton finally arrived at Stromness, the first people to see him ran away in concern. He, Worsley and Creasy wore tattered clothes. They had matted beards and their hair and skin was black from months of cooking with blubber. When they finally spoke to someone, Shackleton asked to see the station manager. <clears throat> Who are you? Asked the station manager. Well, don't you know me? Asked Shackleton. I know your voice, said the station manager. My name is Shackleton, said Shackleton. And upon hearing this, it said that the station manager uh, had tears in his eyes. Shackleton later wrote, when I look back on those days, I have no doubt that Providence guided us, not only across those snow fields, but across a stormy sea that separated Elephant Island from our landing place in South Georgia. I know that during that long and ranking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. I said nothing to my companions on the point, but afterwards, Worsley said to me, boss, I had a curious feeling on the march that there was another person with us. Crean confessed the same idea. The record of our journeys would be incomplete without this reference. 
to a subject very near to our hearts. And here in this picture, look at Shackleton, Crean, and Worsley. Just look at them. They're clean shaven and wearing borrowed clothes. And when a boat was sent to pick up the other three men who remained at King Hogan Bay, um, the three men questioned the crew why Shackleton hadn't either sent Crean or Worsley with them. They were just so surprised. Um, they didn't know that they had reached, uh, of course, they had no idea that they had reached the Stromness Whaling Station. And all of a sudden, around comes this boat to rescue them. Um, and they couldn't believe that Shackleton wouldn't send either Crean or Worsley on the boat. And Worsley, who was right there in front of them, said, what's the matter with you? And then only then was it that they realized that was him. They just didn't even recognize him all cleaned up. So visiting South Georgia now is not that much different than visiting it 100 years ago, with the exception that the whaling stations are no longer in use and they're being overtaken by seals and penguins and Mother Nature in general. South Georgia is 104 miles long and anywhere from 1.4 to 39 miles wide. It's very mountainous. Uh, it's got 11 peaks that rise over 6,500 feet and over 60 different glaciers plunge to the sea. There's no native population, only a handful of British government officials, some scientists from the British Antarctic Survey and a support staff, team of support staff at Gritviken. Nowadays, um, the uh, South Georgia Island is mostly known for its rich wildlife and biodiversity. This actually, this, this map here is uh, the first map made of South Georgia Island by Captain Cook. And, um, but nowadays it's mostly known for its tremendously rich biodiversity and uh, animal life. Here at Salisbury Plain, there are over 100,000 breeding king penguins. South Georgia is frequently referred to as the Galapagos of the South for its biodiversity and also its remote location. And it's also been called Antarctica in a nutshell because it has all the best parts of Antarctica nicely packaged in one small location. It's hard to go even an hour without seeing amazing wildlife such as these king penguins or fur seals or any number of marine birds like the wandering albatross, petrels, skua, and prions. The size of the elephant seals is absolutely amazing. It's just a paradise for wildlife enthusiasts and photographers. The only way to get to and from South Georgia is by boat. There are no airstrips and no other way to reach the island. The voyage can take anywhere from a handful of days from the Falkland Islands to a couple of weeks if you're on a small sailing vessel. On our previous expeditions, we worked with ocean-wide expeditions for this passage on the very comfortable Plancius, which accommodates roughly 100 passengers. Our expedition to South Georgia includes a variety of people, including those who are doing the Shackleton Crossing, and also people who are staying on board to tour the coastline of the island and do day hikes, but stay on the ship at night. This allows family and friends with differing tolerances for adventure to share the same journey with only a couple of days apart. And this makes it somewhat of an unusual and unique opportunity in the expedition travel um, realm. The Shackleton Crossing starts in King Hokan Bay, where his team, uh, if you remember that map, where his team had, uh, had repositioned to and where, um, where they had set up a temporary camp. So we are ferried to the shore here by Zodiacs with our skiing kit. And then we pack up our sleds and we put on our harnesses and we head out. And there of course is the very important pre before picture, before expedition picture. Um, and I just wanna point out here, there we are heading out. Um, uh, you can see that our route is visible there we go, um, along with a wonderful elephant seal. Our route is visible here. We're going to go up this glacier, and then we're going to curve, and we're going to kind of go through these mountains here. So here's our route across the island. That's the, a topo map that, um, is, of course, is more modern. And here, if you overlay Shackleton's route onto our route, this is Shackleton's rough memory route pulled off of the other map. You can see what a remarkably good job Shackleton did finding his way solely based on what he knew about the island who, and the island of an in, the island whose interior he had never seen before and was unmapped. So this is our route coming, you know, with with GPS information and 
uh, choosing the best route, the most efficient route in here, Shackleton's. You can see he did an amazing job with no resources. Our first day is spent ascending the Murray Snowfield and then on up to the Trident Ridge. <clears throat> the ascent on the first day is around 4,000 feet in total on uh, gentle to moderate slopes. And I want you just to notice the weather here. This is important. Okay, this is, this is let's just say it's at 10 a.m. and there's noon. <clears throat> Can you see the team there? This is a little later on in the same afternoon. You can see there's the team. We're surrounded by a cloud, diminishing the visibility to near zero. And this is sort of common on South Georgia. The weather is very fickle. But then we emerge uh, at, to the top of the snowfield, and the clouds open up, and we're treated to a great view of the Trident Ridge, which is a series of peaks that mark the biggest crux of the route. We spend the first night near the Trident Ridge, it's a very full day with great views if the weather permits. So here's the uh, different map that shows a little bit, a uh, little bit more of the relief. The most challenging part of the expedition can be the weather, but the biggest crux is descending from the Trident Ridge, which is right here. You can see it's a pretty steep drop. <clears throat> the Trident Ridge towers over the Crean Glacier, roughly 1,500 feet below. It's a steep descent with crevasses and the potential for avalanche. And as a part of our descent plan, um, we made a snow wheel to roll down the slope to scout out for any crevasses and to potentially trigger avalanches. The wheel uh, was very big and heavy. It, uh, it rolled down over 900 feet in nearly a straight line, giving us a really decent route to follow. And it ended on the edge of a marginal crevasse that it had exposed for us, which was pretty cool. And here's a view from the ridge as one team descends over the upper portion of it. And then from the bottom, looking back up, here's a look at the Trident Ridge from the Crean Glacier. Several hours of travel later on the Crean Glacier, there are the remnants of a Wessex 5 helicopter that crashed during the Battle of Gritviken in April of 1982. That was a part of the Falklands War. Though it's mostly covered by snow, some of it can be seen depending on annual snow conditions. Fortunately, there were no fatalities from the crash. The helicopter had been transporting troops when it, it went into bad weather and had to make an emergency landing slash crash, but all the troops and pilots survived and were rescued. And here's what it looks like when you can see it now, and here's what it looked like um, at the time. And that photo is from the Imperial War Museum. So the route continues past, here's where we started, here's the Trident Ridge. Um, it continues past an obvious Nunatuk right here and the second yellow dot that makes a good camp, and then to a ridge just above Fortuna Bay. This is Fortuna Bay and um, to a ridge just above. Now this descent is a second technical crux, crux of the expedition. And in the past, uh, due to poor weather and, and a general lack of, of visibility, we have opted not to go down um, one of these gullies. We've opted to go around here um, and and do a slightly altered route, which was safer in those conditions down to Fortuna Bay. And this is the alternate, whoops, there's the Nunatuk. There we are going past the Nunatuk. And <clears throat> here's the descent down to down the Fortuna Glacier to Fortuna Bay. And here's just a different vantage point of that descent taken by um, somebody that was on the ship. So we ski to the edge of the snow and then we uh, take off our skis and bring our sleds to the edge of the bay where we drop the bulk of our kit, which gets picked up by the ship. And we take our, our after shot. So here's Fortuna Bay right here at the third yellow dot. And from here, we continue the rest of the route um, with the other ship passengers. And this last bit of Shackleton's crossing is known as the Shackleton walk. It's relatively easy and can be done in hiking boots or snowshoes, making it accessible to a lot of people. It's also a really special part of the route because it was on this final leg of the journey that Shackleton heard the whistle bell from Stromness calling people to breakfast. It was here that he finally knew that he was on the right track. And here we are approaching the Stromness station in the beautiful late afternoon light. Stromness in 1916 looked a lot like this. This photo is actually of Gritviken, but Stromness would have looked like it. And nowadays it's abandoned and a protected heritage site. 
were allowed to explore from a distance, but due to asbestos and some other concerns, the buildings are off limits to visitors. And there's another shot of Stromness. With the Shackleton crossing completed, the rest of our time on South Georgia is spent visiting the historical sites and amazing wildlife areas that are must see spots. These include Grit Viken, which is home to a nice museum, a church and a post office and a cemetery, which is where Shackleton is buried. And here is his grave. And on the back, it's inscribed with a line from one of his favorite Browning poems that says, I hold that a man should strive to be the uttermost for his life's set prize. Shackleton actually died at the young age of 47 on board a ship called the Quest. Um, the vessel was for his next Antarctic expedition and he died in the harbor at Gritviken. Next to Shackleton is a grave of Frank Wilde, his right-hand man. It wasn't always there. Wild, uh, Wild, who was really a permanent part of Shackleton's expeditions, had died and had outlived Shack, uh, Shackleton by a long time. And he had died in South Africa. But in 2011, his um, ashes were moved to the Gritviken Cemetery and buried on the right-hand side of Shackleton's grave. There's so much to see in South Georgia. It really seems that around every corner, there's a new discovery and amazing places to see. An excellent team of field guides aboard the ship helped to round out this experience with lectures and insights and answers to all of our questions. And while we're there, we see the passing of nature and its most pristine state. And we have the opportunity to be observers of a world where humans are only visitors. You really will find South Georgia to be a treasure trove of wonder. The amount of diversity and the amount of life on the island is absolutely amazing. And at the end of the day, I'll admit that it's really nice to return to a floating home where a comfortable cabin, delicious meals, and the camaraderie of fellow adventurers await. It's not quite the same as the endurance, but it's a lot more luxurious than our tents. So whatever happened to the crew of the Endurance? Well, they survived a rough existence on Elephant Island. Though they remained hopeful and had faith in Shackleton, there were seeds of doubt that he would succeed. And several of the team were severely depressed. In fact, one of them was actually on suicide watch. Frank Wilde, who had been left in charge, had his hands full, but few people could have managed the situation as he did. Shackleton, who had sailed from South Georgia, island to uh, Punta Arenas, Chile, um, to organize a rescue, had been hard at work, really hard at work, uh, raising the funds and trying to raise funds and organize the rescue in Punta Arenas, Chile. Three attempts to rescue the people at South Georgia or at Elephant Island failed. And then finally, on August 30th, 1916, on his fourth rescue attempt, Shackleton finally reached Elephant Island on board a steamer named the Yelko that was lent to him from the Chilean government. The Yelko lowered a lifeboat with Shackleton in it, and when he was close enough to be heard, he shouted, Are you all well? And Frank Wilde replied, We are well, boss. And then the men of Elephant Island gave a hearty three cheers. There they are giving those cheers. Despite the odds, all 22 men were alive and well for the most part. They were overjoyed to see Shackleton, and many had feared the worst. Um, but the pack ice was closing in, so they had to make a very speedy exit. And within an hour of the Yelko's arrival, they were all on board the small ship heading north to Punta Arenas. They returned back to Punta Arenas, Chile, as heroes. Hundreds of thousands of people were said to crowd the streets of Punta Arenas to greet them. Their celebrity was great, and the expedition was deemed a success, even though it failed in its main objective. Now, not the same success can be told about Shackleton's Ross Sea Party. Often called Shackleton's Lost Men, they had a harrowing experience on the other side of Antarctica and several of the crew lost their lives. This is a story for another time, but it's well documented in the riveting book, The Lost Men, The Harrowing Saga of Shackleton's Ross Sea Party. So the combination of history, scenery, wildlife, and opportunity for adventure is why Outside Magazine and National Geographic Magazine honored our expedition with their coveted Best Trip Awards. 
We're currently planning our next expedition for November of 2021. Uh, additional details can be found on our website or by emailing us or calling us anytime. And that is the end of the presentation. So I hope that you enjoyed that presentation. Um, I enjoyed talking about it. And um, I would encourage you, if you have an opportunity or if you are able to think about joining us on South Georgia Island, either to just tour the island and stay on the ship the whole time, or join us on the Shackleton Crossing, I really encourage you to consider that us a call with any questions. It's such a fabulous experience. Really, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So thank you for watching this presentation, and I hope to be talking to you soon. Bye-bye.